Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. We have a second panel. It will be done in English, and I will switch to English. A uh, panel of speakers. We have Eric Bergler from the Institute of Global Affairs. We have Gerard Roland from the University of California, Berkeley. We have um, Kirsten Atjohni uh, from uh, Sveriges Risk Bank. And we have Farouk Khan from the World Bank. Um, we'll start um, with the general topic. Uh, and this is really something which is critical for Ukraine. And there are very polarizing opinions in Ukraine about the role of the state in economic growth in Ukraine. Everyone agrees that um, the sovereignty and even the survival of Ukraine uh, hinges on our ability to establish a growth and successful economy. We need the economy in Ukraine to grow because there is no other way. Uh, but how exactly to achieve that and what role can be played by the state, this is where there are serious disagreements, ranging from a completely hands-off approach when we say the market will take care of everything to a very extremely protectionist approach where we say the state is the only driver of the economy. But even if we accept any of these positions, there's still a question of what it means for markets to work and what it means for state to actually support a developed economy. And so the topic of the, today's the panel is the role of the state in supporting economic growth. And we'll start with Gerard Roland, who will offer us a perspective on challenges and channels of economic growth in post-communist, or as the joke was earlier, post-capitalist <laughs> societies of the region. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, well, thank, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here, uh, uh, as, as always. Uh, uh, so let, let me start uh, directly talking about the, the subject. And uh, it's, it's actually uh, very uh, close, uh, closely related, to a certain sense, to the uh, earlier talk by um, Gianluca Benigno, uh, you know, because that, that's very important in terms of, of growth. So something that is very important in economics, that was very important, that has been somehow uh, neglected uh, in recent years is what is called the capital levy problem. So what is the capital levy problem? Is the fact that if you want to invest uh, somewhere, there's a big difference between the elasticity of capital to taxation before the investment has been made and afterwards. Before an investment has been made, especially in today's world, people can invest in you know, many different countries, uh, you know, in different continents, etc. Uh, uh, and so, so they're very sensitive to the conditions of, of, uh, uh, of, of uh, the, the economy, the environment, taxation, the rule of law, etc. Uh, but once you have uh, sunk your investment, uh, it's there. You've made the investment, you have a factory, it's producing things, etc. And then you're much more vulnerable to expropriation. You know, not only to higher taxation, but to expropriation. This is called the capital levy problem. And so what does that mean? That means that uh, there is a very important commitment problem because of this different elasticity before and after the investment has been made. And so therefore, if governments want to have high investment, and therefore high growth, you know, because growth is related to investment uh, and to the, the, the intensity of, of investment, well, you need to have commitment not to expropriate. Now, this seems kind of very, very basic, but we see expropriation of investment all the time. Uh, just think in Russia the last few years, you know, the expropriation that took place of, you know, Yuko, Sibnev, etc., this huge renationalization that has been uh, taking place. Uh, uh, in China, there have been uh, similar things, and you know, entrepreneurs I know who invested early in China, uh, they thought, you know, we're afraid of being expropriated, so we try to recoup our investment as much as possible. China is a huge economy, so people are willing to take risks. But if you're a smaller country, and you, if you feel your investment can be expropriated, then that's gonna be bad for growth. So, which means, the commitment not to expropriate is absolutely fundamental. And how do you do that? 
how do you do that? Well, the, the best way so far that has been found is democracy. Democracy is fundamental in order to have a commitment not to uh, expropriate. Now, democracies are not perfect. Democracies are not perfect, but because democracies have uh, uh, you know, uh, the rule of law, because they have separation of powers, uh, because they have institutions that create credibility, that can create commitment not to expropriate. This is, it's never perfect, but this is, it's much stronger than what you see in uh, autocracies. And so, you know, the, the, role, the independence of the judiciary is fundamental in this thing, and, and other uh, uh, institutions are also important, you know. Uh, this is Central Bank uh, Conference. Central Bank independence is a fundamental, fundamental institution if we want to have a, a rule of law. And, and you know, the, the, all the populists in the world, they hate central bank independence. Why? Because they want to come to power to basically print money and then you know, redistribute, and then you have what you have in Venezuela today. So, so that's, that's, that's really, so, so, so the commitment to expropriation, uh, not to expropriate, is, is, is very, very important. And so from that point of view, there is no such thing as illiberal democracy. Democracy is not about the majority uh, 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 expropriating or oppressing the, the, the minority. This is, this, is, you know, this is very important. So many people who kind of think, yeah, democracy can be, you know, is just an accessory, they say, well, what about Singapore? Well, Singapore is a city-state, is an extremely open economy, and so if they didn't have, it's true, it's not a democracy, but they have very strong rule of law. If they didn't have rule of law, they wouldn't be as affluent as they are today. Singapore, by the way, is one of the only countries in the tropics, in the area of the tropics, which in general are not you know, uh, propitious for growth, to be in the league of uh, high income uh, countries. And, and so, so we do see that there is really a danger of populism. And, and so, so the populists, they are the first who are going to want to expropriate. Because if you expropriate some investment, you say, ha ha, we got these rich guys, and then now we're going to redistribute everything. Uh, well, you know, you, you end up with autocracy, you end up with uh, journalists being killed, judges being uh, removed, etc. You know, look at what's been happening in Turkey, uh, look at uh, what's happening in, in Russia. And, and this is absolutely, you know, uh, this is not just about politics, it's about growth. Because by having the right institutions, that's how, that is how you create commitment not to expropriate and that's what is going to be fundamental for growth. And this is especially important in post-communist countries, and here I come to the, the regional aspect, because post-communist countries, if you look a little bit at the history, uh, uh, those were uh, um, you know, communist regimes, and then too often we think, oh, transition, we got rid of that. But it's not really the right way to look at things. What happened is that Communist regimes, the authority of the regime kind of uh, eroded gradually. And then what you had is that as communist power eroded, you had networks of political entrepreneurs, oligarchs, etc., who started grabbing pieces of state power. Uh, uh, and, and this is something that is fundamental in post-communist countries. That is why post-communist countries tend to have bad scores on institutions, while they have bad scores on rule of law, while they have very bad scores on corruption, and also bad scores on, on democracy. So, so, you know, so, so in a way, it's a special challenge for post-communist countries. At the time of transition, you know, however imperfect, etc. as long as you just let things go, at least, you know, some, some market forces would happen. But when you have a state apparatus that has become corrupt, that has become essentially an instrument that is like an ATM machine for oligarchs, where basically taxpayers are being flawed and then people get enriched on the bag of taxpayers and then you have very low growth as, as a consequence, this is, this is important, you know, Ukraine has, has been suffering too much from that, and, and there's, a, there's a, certainly a very important political will, you know, to, to change this. And, and this is an international battle. It's an international battle because uh, the Putin regime, Putin government, I'm, I'm not saying Russia, but it's really the Putin government, uh, they think it's in their big interest to continue to have the state as an ATM machine. It's important to continue the networks of corruption. And that is why 
all battles against this, as we've seen in Ukraine the last few years, all battles for democracy are seen as threatening to the Putin regime. That's why the European Union is under attack. That's why advanced democracies are under attack. This is really an international battle. And as I said, it's not just about politics, it's, it's really about growth. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is, this is fantastic. And this um, now opens um, a possibility for Eric to talk about the role of the state in promoting growth, in particular about the state uh, which faces challenges. Thank you. Uh, absolutely, and it, it's, as Gerard said, it's wonderful to be back in, in Ukraine. Um, there are few cities more beautiful than Kiev at this time of year. But it's also important to acknowledge what has been achieved in, in Ukraine. Uh, I used to go, when I was at the EBRD, on a, very regularly to the National Bank of Ukraine. And I can say, to interact with the National Bank of Ukraine today, compared to then is, is like two different worlds. And, and uh, you know, when we, di when we um, are pessimistic about uh, the opportunities in Ukraine, I think, look at what, what happened to this institution. It's, it's, it's incredible. So, so I was gonna talk a little bit about uh, industrial policy, and I'm, go you know, I'm gonna use industrial policy in the same sense as basically growth policy. So, so industrial policy is very much back in business. If you, even in, in the, the UK, the conservative government that you know, didn't want to use the concept at all, is now there is a, even a, a ministry for a industrial strategy. Uh, so it's, it's something that is very much a part of, of uh, the political discussion and something that one has to uh, think about. And, I think Ukraine is coming to a, a state of development, coming out of uh, all the turbulence uh, after Maidan, and uh, to, to think about these issues, and that's, that's uh, the context in which I will make my remarks. So, so, um, so industrial policy is gonna be different for, across countries for, for several reasons. One reason is you know, where you are in terms of technology relative to the frontier. When you are at the frontier, it's, it's really about genuine innovation. But when you are a bit further away from, from um, the frontier, it's about innovation in the sense of getting new projects, uh, products, uh, new processes, new forms of organization in the local environment. And that you can do by imitating, adapting. Of course, you can also have genuine innovation. But it, what really is important at that phase is to, to um, get uh, these technologies working in, in your local environment. But, of course, there's a role, or could be a role for the state in, in facilitating that. And, so, and, and there is this paradox of, uh, of industrial policy that when you think that the state probably is more likely to be, be successful when it's about facilitating imitation, facilitating transfer technologies from, from uh, from uh, frontier countries, that's when the state's capacity is the weakest. And it's this kind of paradox that I, I want to, to, to reflect on. And what, what, what kind of industrial policy can you imagine in, in a place like Ukraine? And, and I think one has to remember that countries that are now emerging economies have a challenge that is in many ways greater than countries that maybe went through this uh, transition or this uh, move from, from away uh, from the frontier to, to the frontier in the 20th century because the constraints that we are facing now in terms of environment, in terms of social constraints, but also the, the, the speed of technological change makes this uh, transition or this transformation uh, uh, more, di more difficult. So, so when you are a bit away from the frontier, I said, you know, it's about technology transfer, it's about reallocating factors across industries, it's about improving management practices. It's, it sounds uh, maybe trivial, but actually there's a lot of evidence now that this is, is really fundamental for, for differences across countries. And, of course, it's not something you do easily, but it's something that you can 
uh, have as an objective for, for, for policy. And of course, it's also about affecting a lot of the institutional um, dimensions. About, it's obviously about corruption, it's about relieving credit constraints, it's about, um, about education and, and skill formation. So, so um, when you are further away from the frontier, you need policies that really can achieve these uh, objectives, policies that can achieve uh, a transfer of, of uh, uh, fact, uh, a tr transfer of, te of technology, policies that can uh, help uh, reallocate factors across industries. So, so we have sort of a set of, of uh, policies that we can think of. We have the sort of traditional horizontal policies that are policies that are trying to improve for everybody. It's about um, education, it's about um, the, the um, uh, it's about financial, developing the financial system. These are relatively uncontroversial, but they, they're probably not going to help. Uh, or they, they are certainly going to help, but they're not, maybe not be, be enough. And uh, then on the other hand, you have what we call vertical policies, policies that are really in the, identifying specific industries, the specific uh, firms even, national champions and so on. And the, we know from, this, from experience that these are extremely demanding on state institutions. So the, if you have limited state capacity, these policies are very difficult. Luckily, there is a whole range of, of policies in between. I could call them sector-based horizontal policies or sector policies that can be about addressing specific uh, training needs, educational needs in individual sectors. They can be about specific um, needs in, in individual sectors in terms of relaxing financing constraints. It can be about uh, introducing, in traditional sectors, IT, for example. So in agriculture, you know, a lot has been achieved in many parts of Europe, uh, but also in, in the emerging world, uh, the, um, uh, a lot has been achieved by introducing IT into agriculture, by combining IT uh, and the textile industry, for example. A lot of improvements in, in India and, and Bangladesh because of that. You have um, also, this is what usually called smart specialization. I think this is a, a policy that is, is something that, that is very worthwhile uh, trying in a, in a context like Ukraine. But maybe the most important and, and the most important uh, industrial policy now is, is about connecting firms to global value chains. And that's where what the world has gone through in the last uh, decade or so, this, what Richard Baldwin has described as the, the great convergence. when. The, you know, it's so much more about transferring information across borders today uh, than about products. And, and, and it's that world where you don't no longer have to produce a whole car to enter um, the global uh, markets. You can produce a small part, just maybe a gearbox or whatever it is. And, and it's that opportunity that is there for emerging economies now to grab. And that's where I think a lot of the government uh, um, efforts should be directed. And if, if you look at what, what uh, Central Europe has done, it's very much about that. Of course, they had a lot of help from, from the whole EU accession process. They had a lot of help from the initiatives of individual firms. But it's, it's that process that, that is going to be ex extremely important and where I think the government will be, be critical. And of course, uh, there's also and, and that, there, I think, a lot of progress has been made in, in Ukraine on uh, intelligent procurement. So using procurement <coughs> in a way to help firms join uh, um, uh, these uh, global value chains, but also to help firms uh, you know, compete in a fair, fair way. So to, to sum up, I think that industrial policy will be very important uh, in the next phase of Ukraine's uh, development. We know that there are <clears throat> very serious uh, constraints in terms of state capacity, but I think there is a, a range of policies that can be explored and, and uh, that we should try to, to see how can they apply, be applied in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, and um, we'll have Farouk uh, talk about um, the World Bank's perspective, I, I guess, on the possibilities for policies in Ukraine to follow up on Eric's uh, 
perspectives. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I apologize uh, that our country director, uh, Satu Kakonen, was not able to um, uh, be here, but um, I'm a disappointing replacement for her. Um, I will talk today about um, uh, the uh, role of policies and institutions in supporting economic growth, uh, and in particular the case of Ukraine. Um, about 15 years ago, Bill Easterly and uh, Ross Levine wrote an article in the Journal of um, Monetary Economics that had a very interesting title. It was called Tropics, Germs, and Crops, uh, How Endowments Influence Economic Development, where they asked the question that, uh, the, what is more important for economic growth? Is it geographic endowments such as location, um, natural resources, or climate? Or is it policies and institutions? Um, and what they um, concluded from that analysis was that uh, the most important is policies and institutions. Um, geographic endowments matter uh, mostly through their impact often on policies and institutions. Now, turning to the case of Ukraine, Ukraine has extraordinary endowments. Um, it has a strategic location at the intersection of uh, Europe and Asia. Um, it has um, uh, the largest uh, stock of arable land in Europe, uh, one third of the world's endowment of black soil. Um, it has a history of uh, production at the technological frontier. The world's largest aircraft was produced in Ukraine as in still functional today. Um, it has uh, energetic, hardworking, and uh, educated people. So given these endowments, one would naturally expect that U Ukraine would be a prosperous country. The fact today is very different. In 2015, per capita GDP in Ukraine was $2,000. Ukraine was among the poorest countries in Europe. Compare that to about $9,000 per capita in Turkey and Romania, $12,000 in Poland, even Indonesia has a higher per capita GDP than, uh, uh, than Ukraine. When I ask people that, they're surprised. $3,300 in Indonesia. When you, when you do this on a purchasing power parity uh, basis, the comparison doesn't get any better. Ukraine is still the poorest among the countries I've, uh, I've mentioned. Uh, what is the reason? When you look at the history of economic growth over the last 15 years, uh, or between 2000 and 2015, uh, GDP growth in Ukraine has been a paltry 2% per year. You know, compare that to 4.2% in Turkey, 3.6% in Poland and Romania, 5% um, in Indonesia and Malaysia, and 9.5% of course in China. China of course wins hands down when it comes to economic growth in, the, in recent decades. Even when you look at the recent history, um, you know, forget the crisis. You know, is it, is it because of the crisis, last two years when the economy collapsed? No. Even before the crisis, in the five years preceding the crisis, um, uh, 2008 to 2013, uh, economic growth in Ukraine was actually below zero. Average economic growth was below zero. So the history of growth in Ukraine has been, has been very poor. Uh, so we did some analysis um, last year to look at, you know, what are the main uh, drivers of this? Um, and we came up with four policy areas. We talked earlier about the importance of policies and institutions. We came up with basically four policy areas. Um, uh, the first of those is macroeconomic stability. Ukraine has had a history of macroeconomic instability. Even preceding the current crisis, the current account deficit in Ukraine was 9.2% of GDP. For the five years preceding the uh, current crisis, the fiscal deficit, including quasi-fiscal deficits from the gas sector, from the financial sector, averaged about 7% of GDP. Um, when you have uh, an economy with such large macroeconomic imbalances, when the easy money runs out, the economy collapses. This is what has been happening in Ukraine. You've had periods of economic growth when the easy money flowed in, when external conditions were very favorable, but when the conditions turned, the economy tanks, and on average, you get zero. This is what's been happening in Ukraine. Of course, much has been done in the last uh, three years uh, in the face of these shocks to fix many of the fundamental drivers of this macroeconomic stability. The fiscal deficit has been reduced uh, significantly from 10.1% of GDP in 2014 
to 2% of GDP in 2016, um, and that's including the quasi-fiscal uh, um, deficits. Um, the current account balance has been re was reduced from 9.2% uh, in 2013 um, uh, uh, to uh, in, in 2016, it was uh, just over 3% of GDP. Um, but some of the fundamental uh, structural weaknesses remain. And these are areas where much more needs to be done going forward. Um, in the financial sector, um, much has been done to um, strengthen supervision, uh, to put in place a, um, a framework to resolve and recapitalize uh, um, weak banks. But that process uh, needs to continue. Um, and Ukraine still needs to do a lot to get the credit flowing again. Um, Non-performing loans are still about 30%. Um, and uh, under that environment, uh, the banking sector just cannot be a provider of credit to the economy. Um, the uh, state-owned banking sector is now uh, accounts for more than half of all assets in the banking sector. So improving corporate governance of um, uh, the state-owned banking sector and reforming uh, state-owned banks more generally and restructuring them and preparing them possibly, for some of them for privatization, is also going to be very important um, going uh, forward. The second big area um, of policies is uh, policies to improve uh, productivity. When you look at uh, productivity growth in Ukraine, it's averaged 1.2% over the last 15 years. Few countries have been able to generate sustained economic growth with such a weak record on productivity growth. When you look at the structure of Ukraine's exports, and the sophistication of Ukraine's export and compare that to many other countries in Eastern Europe, Ukraine has gone in the wrong direction. The sophistication of exports in Poland and Romania has improved for the last 15 years. In Ukraine, it's actually gone in the other direction because it's relied increasingly on uh, natural resource uh, exports. So what are the policies to improve uh, productivity? We think there are three main areas. The first is infrastructure investment. Um, uh, if you look at Ukraine's uh, public expenditures, um, uh, even preceding the crisis, it's averaged about 45% of GDP. Um, but when you look at public investment, 2% of GDP. Ukraine has enormous current expenditure obligations, which squeezes out the resources available for public investment, and the public investment management systems have also historically been very weak. So creating fiscal space for public investment and improving public investment management systems is critical to improving the performance and productivity. The second area to improve productivity performance is to create a level playing field. Ukraine has some very large and powerful producers um, that uh, 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 that basically does not uh, 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 generate the environment necessary for competition and improving productivity. Uh, improving that will require both uh, more deregulation so that the small players can come in, the small and more competitive players can come in, but also uh, improving um, a, a, the enforcement of uh, a, the competition policy by improving the capacity of the anti-monopoly committee of, uh, of Ukraine. Um, the third very important area to improve productivity is, um, is improving the management of land. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, Ukraine has um, the largest stock of arable land in, Ukraine, uh, in, in Europe, um, but land management in Ukraine is extraordinarily weak. Um, the uh, state land, uh, about a fourth of agricultural land is state land, uh, and it's, uh, it suffers from uh, a very low level of registration, which uh, encourages non-transparent practices um, and uh, you know, uh, non-productive use of this land. Um, and private land is, uh, is also um, uh, suffers from having uh, errors in the cadaster. Uh, as well as a moratorium on the sale of all private land. Um, so improving uh, the management of land is going to be critical in unleashing Ukraine's potential in agriculture. Um, the, uh, the third um, area, um, 
uh, the third uh, big policy area that we think is important is more, uh, providing more effective social services. Ukraine spends an enormous amount. When you compare to other countries, Ukraine actually spends one, uh, uh, one of the highest shares of its GDP on social services, health, education, social protection. But it does a very poor job of delivering quality social services. When you look at the Human Development Index in Ukraine, it's among the lowest uh, among comparative countries. So, uh, and that ha this has very particular implications, but because when you look at the micro uh, dynamics of household income growth in Ukraine, most of household income, or a large part of household income growth, comes from the growth in social services over the last 15 years. Um, a, 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 a not a, a, a as large a share comes from the growth of uh, employment and, and wages. Um, and and the, uh, the international experience is that countries that are able to provide more effective social services, more effective education and health, have households that rely more on sustainable growth in employment and wages to support income growth. Um, so providing more effective services by reforming uh, health care, um, by reforming education, by providing more targeted social assistance is going to be very important uh, going forward. And the final thing is, of course, improving governance and, uh, and institutions. When you look at corruption perceptions in, in Ukraine, uh, corruption perceptions in Ukraine are closer to uh, those at the bottom of the barrel um, and, and far from uh, the level of corruption perceptions in the European Union that Ukraine hopes to join. Um, so uh, improving um, uh, governance uh, and uh, anti-corruption institutions will be critical uh, and have a very important impact across the board in many of the other policy areas uh, that I mentioned. And there are particular examples of uh, where corruption makes a very big difference. For example, um, uh, weak tax administration, um, uh, you know, sub, uh, leads, uh, undermines macroeconomic uh, stability. Um, the, a, a, an oligarchical uh, production structure undermines um, productivity growth. <coughs> Weak management of public resources undermines effective delivery of social services. So we think that um, the, you know the the strategy for governance and uh, improving governance and uh, institutions in Ukraine really has to have two dimensions. One is to actually improve the institutions, the justice institutions that were talked about before. Um, improving uh, public administration, but these things take time. In many in, in many countries, improving institutions can take a generation. So in addition, to those, in addition to improving, you know, making the progress and improving institutions, Ukraine also needs to, uh, you know, push forward those policies that undermine vested interests. When you improve tax administration, you undermine tax evasion and, you know, disempower vested interests through, uh, through that uh, route. When you improve the uh, enforcement of competition policy, you, uh, you undermine uh, the, the power of uh, a, you know, the concentrated production structure and improve, uh, not only improve productivity, but you also, that's also institutional change. Um, so I think the, the two prongs of, uh, uh, the, there needs to be a strategy on two fronts to uh, address uh, governance and institutions. I want to end on a positive note. Um, <laughs> because it's, it's not all, uh, you know, and the positive note is that um, uh, when you look at what has been done in Ukraine in the last um, uh, three years, uh, the enormous progress has been made. More has been done to reform policies and institutions in Ukraine in the last three years than has been done in the last two decades. And as a, as a, as a result of this, economic growth returned to Ukraine in 2016 uh, after a long period of time. The economy grew by 2.3%, but the growth remains modest, poverty is up, uh, the medium-term uh, uh, pressures that, would create, that could create macroeconomic imbalances remain, so much more needs to be done in many of those policy areas that I just mentioned. Thank you very much. Thank you. This was a fantastic uh, ending on the positive note. <laughs> and uh, Kirsten, the, the floor is yours. Uh, you'll talk about the challenges uh, for the central banking. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me here today. It's a pleasure for, to be here and to be back in Kiev. 
Uh, I will talk about challenges for central banks in developing economies, and I shall say that we have been working together with the central bank here now for a few years, and uh, uh, I can just agree with, with what has been said here, that there has been a great development in the central bank in the, and the central bank's way of working and their organization. Uh, central banks have a Im very important role in the economy and I will talk about uh, the central bank's role in also creating growth for the economy. Um, we have been, uh, we have what we call technical experience to, uh, technical assistance to a few countries and uh, we can see that when they are developing there are experiences that can be drawn and that there are uh, areas where we which I want to highlight in order to make you understand that it's not so easy for the central banks either. Uh, but the central banks, when the new societies are built, central banks are uh, rather often one of the first institutions that are in place. Maybe it's after the national flag, but before the uh, national airline. Uh, the core functions of the central banks is, uh, of course, uh, monetary policy to make sure that there is a, cu a currency in place and pr that we have price stability. But it's also important for the central bank to, uh, to work for uh, financial stability in the financial market. And uh, independence was mentioned here before, and I would say that independence for a central bank is a prerequisite for it to make sure that it can act in a proper way. Um, uh, I mentioned price stability and uh, financial stability, but uh, central banks are also important when it comes to the uh, financial markets and the infrastructure. Central banks are banks for banks, so we provide liquidity to central to the banks in the markets, but we are also uh, important in the way the financial markets are built. We provide also the uh, uh, way that payments can be done in a secure and proper way. So these core functions are vital for the economic growth. If we don't have a good infrastructure in the financial market, the market then cannot support the real economy in a proper way. So um, over time there has been of course a discussion on the central bank's mandate. It's been discussion about the independence, if it's really important to have independent uh, central banks. But the, I think nowadays uh, most, uh, both politicians but also market participants and the central banks agree that it is important with the independence of central banks. They shall be free from fiscal dominance and uh, there should be clear goals for the central banks when it comes to price stability and financial stability. Um, the, as I mentioned in the beginning, the Riksbank, Bank, we have had a, a long time commitment to work with central banks in developing countries. We have been working on this for 15 years. We have been working with Sri Lanka, Uganda, Namibia, Albania and Vietnam. And now we, today we work with uh, Kenya, we work with Ukraine and we work with Palestine. Um, our approach to this staff exchange program is to provide our best technical assistance. So this is done on a very collegial basis that we can uh, give the other central banks the uh, best practices that we have seen in central banking. And um, uh, this is, uh, I, I will try to highlight a few of the challenges that we have identified in the work we have had with the uh, other uh, central banks. Uh, first and foremost, some institutional preconditions must be in place uh, for central banks to succeed. And uh, here the legal framework is extremely important that the legal framework is in place so that the uh, it's clear what is the mandate for the central bank and that it's uh, open and transparent what the uh, politicians and the market awaits the uh, central bank to deliver. And uh, we have seen in many countries central banks have been given many different objectives and sometimes contradictory uh, objectives. So here it's very important that the objectives for the central banks are clear. And it's also important that the uh, stakeholders are on board. It's important that the politicians stand behind the central banks and support its independence. 
politicians must place confidence in the central bank and confidence in the central bank is crucial for it to really achieve its goals. So this is the first challenge to make sure that you have a good external framework to, uh, for the central bank to work within. The second challenge, I would say, is the internal framework, because uh, if the goals are set and you are un they are understandable, you make, have to make sure that there is a strategy within the central bank how to achieve those goals. And you have also to make sure that you have a relevant organization for working upon your goals. And uh, here again, I mean, we have seen quite many central banks who have uh, a too big organization, the number of staff in many central banks is very high, they are bureaucratic and they are to some extent inefficient. Here I must really say that we are impressed of what has happened in Ukraine at the central bank. They, you have really been working on this to try to make your activities more efficient. I think you have cut your staff from 12,000 to 5,000 and you are continuing on that route. Uh, we have done the same in the RICS Bank. In the middle of the 90s, we had 1,200 uh, persons in the bank, and we had uh, offices, uh, 24 offices throughout the country. Today, we have uh, just the head office in, uh, in Stockholm and one small uh, uh, office for notes and coins, and we are 330 persons within the bank. So that is also a journey for us. But I think this is something uh, which is important, and it is important that for the central banks to focus on what is core business. I think uh, there are uh, quite many nice things that we can be working with, but we have to focus on the core issues. The third issue uh, and challenge for central banks is about transparency and communication. And I think it is a common misunderstanding that the communication sometimes is a little bit of a side activity, but for us, uh, communication and transparency is also core business. Because if, if we cannot really explain the uh, strategy for the central bank and the goals and why it is important with the independence, then it's very hard for us to get confidence in our activities. So uh, clear and uh, consistent and transparent communication is also a precondition for building confidence in central banks. Uh, I would also like to say something about uh, our challenges for central banks, what we can see now, and uh, that's about the future for cash and electronic payments. And I know that this is also an issue here in Ukraine. Uh, there is a discussion of a ca cashless uh, society. And uh, in Sweden, the Riksbank, we have also currently set up a new pro project in order to investigate if there maybe is, uh, if the Riksbank Bank in the future should issue a digital uh, krona, an e-krona. And this is uh, coming, we can see this is a, a hot discussion in many, many countries at the moment. And we can also see that um, customers say uh, the, the, the use of notes and coin, coins is uh, sharply diminishing, at least in our country. So there is a, a wish also from the consumers to use uh, a digital payment that's in, to a larger extent. Um, finally, uh, I would also maybe say something more about uh, central banks as uh, in institutions. Um, my colleagues is sometimes saying when they are out discussing with central banks in other countries that the central banks rather often has a, a better uh, trust from the public and from the politicians and other uh, institutions and uh, official authorities. And uh, maybe, I don't know if that's right, but rather often they are saying that central bank staff is more reliable, they are well educated, they are uh, good discussion partners, and they are maybe less corrupt. So in that sense, central banks can maybe also act a little bit more in order to to uh, get a change. And I think this has also been clear here in Ukraine that the central bank has pushed forward uh, bank reforms, which have maybe not been so very popular always, 
but we have seen that it has given a good result in the market, and it's probably more that has to be done in this area. Uh, but still, you need someone, you need authorities and maybe independent authorities who have the efforts and possibilities to encourage change. Because if you don't have a financial sector that can support the real economy, then you will not have growth in the longer perspective. So I will uh, finalize here and say that central banks are also very important. It's not a prerequisite for growth, but they are important in order to work together with governments and other institutions to create the long-term group for society. Thank Thanks. you very much. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to start with a round of bigger picture question, trying to bring some of the themes that have been discussed to sort of um, current policy questions that um, are close to heart of many people in Ukraine. I'll try to formulate them in, in a conceptual manner that we can focus on the substance, and then we will provide an opportunity to the panelists to react to each other's points and to the questions, and after that we'll open the floor for Q&A with the um, general audience here. Um, so I'll start uh, in the same order with uh, Gerard. Uh, you talked about the democracy and you talked about the growth. And Ukraine is in the midst of the security conflict, to put it mildly. Um, and um, we also observe a lot of actions which sometimes polarize the society. And I'm not going to talk about ethnic issues, I'm not going to talk about language or the standard. I will just uh, mention a number of uh, policy decisions which were implemented recently, including e-declaration for NGOs on anti-corruption uh, uh, organizations, uh, including decrees which remove passports from uh, some officials who have dual passports, uh, including, um, for instance, uh, banning of contact and um, a number of other, Adna Klasnik and other, other companies. And there is a trade-off here. The um, national security and the issue of protection sovereignty, um, this is one argument why these actions are justified. Whereas uh, the alternative argument, of course, is this is anti-democratic and we are building the democratic society. Uh, and then there's a question of hypocrisy, why different rules like e-declarations apply to different people. But that's a more as a side, it's on the margin. The real question here is, in a country like Ukraine, where we are trying to build democracy, how do you find the balance between the issues of national security, which require restrictions, uh, if you take that argument, and the democratic values which go against that. Thank you. So, um, well, thanks for the question first. And um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm not aware of everything going on, so, so you may correct me, I may say uh, things that are uh, factually wrong, but uh, what I have seen is that the argument of national security has been used uh, uh, in wrong ways every time I have seen them. So, uh, for example, very recently, the uh, um, trying to, um, you know, uh, ban uh, Contacte and, you know, uh, these Russian social media, etc. apart from the problem of implementation, which, you know, is, is maybe a little bit unrealistic, I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong. I think, I think to use this uh, uh, is is not only wrong because it goes against you know freedom of the press expression etc but but this sets a precedent for saying you, know, you can use the national security argument to crack down on 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 anybody you know uh, uh, so 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 let, let me come up with with an argument that's not in this country but in Hungary uh, uh, the Orban government is trying to shut down you know uh, the best university in the country Central European University and it's saying, yeah, we have nothing against them. We just want to apply the law, implement the law. And, and the law was, was produced for the sole purpose 
of, of prohibiting that university. So, so uh, the national security argument, you know, can be used, I think, in, in many wrong ways. Another uh, case in which the national security uh, argument has been used is about decentralization. You know, we, we've been talking a lot about this, but I've heard people say, oh, you cannot give more, and, and here, this is completely independent from the Minsk agreement, you know, where this is decentralization, not at all related to Minsk, it's really about what is good for Ukraine independently of the conflict. I've heard very often the argument say, oh, no, no, we cannot give more power to local governments, to mayors, to, to oblasts, etc., uh, because it's bad for national security. So, so uh, uh, I think, on the contrary, that, that decentralization is, is actually very important for unleashing democratic forces, for unleashing entrepreneurship, for unleashing initiatives that are there you know, uh, among the, the young people. So, so um, uh, uh, in a nutshell, I think you know the use of the argument of national security uh, uh, is is used in wrong ways. Now, this is not to diminish. This is not to diminish the issue of the conflict, but I'm going to say something else. Uh, 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 two things. Two things. First of all, if the argument of national security is kind of used more and more, then I would say Putin has won. Putin has won. Because what does Putin want? Putin wants Ukraine to go back to some kind of Yanukovych era, to an era where democracy is suppressed, where corruption can go without protests, without you know, uh, 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 without you know, people uh, going going against it. And so, any defeat for democracy in Ukraine is a victory for Putin. So that's, that's, that's I think, something very important in the national uh, um, security debate. The other thing I want to say, and, and this is probably a bit more fundamental, is that in Ukraine, just like in many other countries, this is something specific to the post-communist world, uh, outside Russia, is that you have had an alliance of liberal Democrats, people who want democracy and modern economy, and ultra-right nationalists. Uh, 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 and, and this alliance came about because, you know, people were against communists, uh, communism for different reasons. So take Poland or Hungary or even Ukraine. People said, you know, we don't like being occupied by the Russians because they, you know, suppress human rights. They, they prevent us from having democracy. And the other side said, we don't want to be occupied by the Russians, etc., because we want to have a pure ethnic, you know, ethnically pure uh, nationalist rule, etc., and that's the most important uh, for us. So, so this alliance, you know, and that, that you see this alliance, you know, this in the Maidan. In the Maidan, you had extreme right forces together with very strong democratic forces. And it's an unstable alliance. It's an unstable alliance. And every time I see, you know, an attack on democracy in this part of the world, I think, aha, this, this is a nationalist group that's kind of, you know, gaining. And Poland is a very good example because they're not pro-Russian, you know, but they're very strongly, uh, the current government, very strongly uh, uh, nationalist. And, and so because, because their nationalism comes before uh, democracy, and, and, and so this is, this is this cleavage between the uh, hard right nationalists and the Democrats is something that is going to be important in all the region in coming years. So, so I don't exclude that Ukraine at some point could become you know, some nationalist Ukraine that is you know, still anti-Russian, et cetera, but that would suppress democracy that would uh, uh, suppress ethnic minorities, that would suppress all sorts of minorities, uh, uh, etc. All right, thank you. I, I'm going to move to Eric and um, ask the question about the industrial policy. And uh, just to build a connection, there's also an argument that it's good that we ban Kentucky and 267 or so many other countries because it opens an opportunity for Ukrainian companies to step in. And so this is where the state policy, I'm, I'm of course making a joke out of it, um, that this is an industrial policy of sorts. Um, but really, the serious question is, um, in a weak state, what guarantees or what are the ways to ensure that any kind of state policy is not captured by the very same vested interests, which are 
holding the economic growth development back? No, I think that's a, absolutely the key question, and that was sort of the, when I spoke about the, the paradox of industrial policy, it's, it's exactly about that. So, so and, and I certainly don't want to say that um, there, that risk is not there. It's, it's very much there, and you know, particularly maybe in, in Ukraine. And, and I mean, there are risks, there are several types of risks. There's the risk of capture, there's also the risk, of course, of, you know, it's the old argument of picking winners or picking losers, and these, these are difficult things. I think that there are, again, instruments within these, what I call, sort of sector uh, policies that can maybe circumvent some of those issues. I spoke about the need to, to uh, use procurement. I think that's a way to, uh, to at least create transparency around procurement. I think it's one way to, to fight against capture. Uh, there are, you know, so, so I think those risks are, are definitely there. The, and, and I didn't probably emphasize that enough in my uh, remarks earlier, you know, this is not an alternative to institutional reform. You need to pursue the institutional agenda. I'm just saying that now, when things are, uh, you know, the, the macroeconomic situation has improved, when you have, I think, addressed some of the core challenges, the, the challenge of getting, you know, the, you know, if someone asked me four years ago or five years ago, you know, what were the core institutions uh, that needed to be addressed. I, certainly the National Bank was one of them. Uh, it was a major source of, of corruption, uh, as, as, as I think you are well aware. And, and the other one was uh, NAFTA gas. And I think, again, you know, the, we, the bottles are not won in either place, but I think we are in a much better place today than we were uh, five years ago. So, you know, as we are making these uh, advances on, on the institutional front, we need to start thinking about how can we use that little extra state capacity that, that we, are, the, we are building. And, and uh, I think, you know, we need to, to there was sort of a, a, a um, orthodoxy around industrial policy that I think we need to challenge. I mean, there is, you know, I think there is no country today and no emerging economy that is not practicing uh, you know, some type of, of uh, industrial policy beyond horizontal policy. We need to think about how can that best be done. And you know, sometimes it's really about simple things like coordination. So there's a very good example of what has been uh, practiced in Peru, where you, you create these kind of uh, networks of, of uh, sector participants in, in individual, in textile industry, and, and, and so on. And then you you, you know, the, the, the government's role is really to identify what are the obstacles to developing this sector. You know, how can we maybe through simple coordination within the industry address those? Uh, are there things we can do in, in the financial sector? Are there things we can do in the, um, in the educational uh, sector? So the risks are, are very real. They are not, an, you know, we need to pr pr proceed with the institutional agenda. I, I just wanted to focus on that as we are building these sort of islands of, of state capacity, can we use it in a productive way to promote growth? Thank you very much. Um, I'll move uh, to Farouk with questions about islands uh, which, um, and areas which can become drivers of the economic growth. And I'm going to talk about the land reform in Ukraine. And I know World Bank has a position. and. Um, um, and there are some issues uh, surrounding the reform. There, there has been resistance to land reform and has been also understanding that could be one of the major uh, push forwards or uh, starters for the economy. Uh, but also the concern is that um, will we face something similar to uh, early privatization where people with liquidity, with excess liquidity, will be able to acquire the land, um, perhaps um, in not the most efficient way. Will we create new generation of oligarchs, uh, land oligarchs, or are they already there? And uh, what can be done? And do, does it, is it going to happen if we have a land reform where there is actually, um, if 
the population cannot really buy the land. Or, um, but this is the common narrative in Ukraine. This is the kind of debate is that we need to move forward because otherwise nothing will happen, or we need to be slow, otherwise we will risk uh, destroying the opportunities. So, but I also want to touch upon in, in my question, um, on another side of this issue, imagine we are successful and all those issues are resolved and we really have a successful land reform and there is a market and people are investing. And now productivity also, we talked, that's why I'm, I'm wrapping back a little bit to your, to your discussion of productivity enhancement in Ukraine. Our productivity is low, but our infrastructural capacity is at the max right now. And if we suddenly start growing in agriculture, do we have infrastructure to be able to deliver, uh, just to move the goods around? But imagine we have infrastructure, we build roads, we need investment for that. But do we have property rights protection going back to capital levy problem? Aren't we stuck in some kind of vicious circle? Then when we start thinking about land reform being the solution for everything, in fact, it's not going to even start, you know, start off or take off because you need to complement it with everything that we have talked about, everyone on this panel. And unless it's somehow a comprehensive approach, the land reform is not going to do anything. So my question is, do you think land reform will be successful and what needs to be done to overcome the challenges? Thank you for that. Uh, I'm not an expert on, on land reform myself, but um, I will respond by, to your um, questions with two things. One is, um, you know, the bank's position on, on land reform is that the lack of land reform is a significant bottleneck uh, in unleashing the, uh, the capacity of the agriculture sector, uh, the potential of the agriculture sector, and that's why it's important to um, uh, make a move and and uh, and and make progress on reforming uh, the state of land management in Ukraine. Um, the uh, the exact um, the nature of uh, uh, the land reform that Ukraine chooses has to be chosen by the Ukrainian people um, and by the government of Ukraine. The World Bank can can advise uh, the government on uh, the overall strategy that it uh, chooses. The other point uh, that I would like to make in uh, response to your question is land reform is definitely not going to be the solution to everything. Um, there are a, a range of uh, uh, thing, uh, a, a policies that need to be addressed in Ukraine uh, to put Ukraine on a, a trajectory of sustainable economic growth. The problem in Ukraine has been that there have been periods where growth has taken place in fits and spurts, but the, uh, the foundations for sustainable uh, economic growth uh, just uh, do not exist. So many of the things that you mentioned, uh, um, uh, infrast you know, uh, uh, improving infrastructure investment, that has to take place. Uh, improving institutions and property rights, um, that has to take place. Um, the, the lack of uh, uh, property rights, the weak um, uh, 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 you know, judiciary, um, that is a serious bottleneck in, in many um, areas. You talk about, you know, talk about the financial sector. Um, you know, getting um, the resolution of uh, uh, non-performing loans of uh, 30 percent, um, you know, um, resolving uh, the assets of all of the uh, banks that have been uh, closed, um, that requires some degree of um, uh, uh, you know, access uh, to a um, swift and effective and efficient uh, judi ju uh, justice system. Um, where you know a lot more uh, has to be done. I mean, there there is uh, uh, the government is committed to um, a, a, a reforming uh, the justice system in Ukraine, and progress is needed uh, uh, there as well. Um, so, so you're absolutely right. Um, uh, I think progress is needed in a number of different areas. Uh, land reform uh, is one. Uh, infrastructure investment is is definitely important, but that will. Uh, require um, you know reforms in other areas to generate the resources for infrastructure investment. Be, uh, you know that will require, for example, pension reform. Pension expenditures um, in Ukraine um, are about one third of all public expenditures, um, and uh, the pension system has a permanent deficit 
of um, about 5% of GDP. Uh, and so not only is the pension system an enormous fiscal uh, uh, liability, but it also delivers very poor protection for the elderly. Uh, many of the, uh, 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 most pensioners, the average pension in Ukraine is less than $2 a day. There's something fundamentally wrong with the design of the pension system. It does not provide people an incentive to actually contribute, um, and it delivers um, uh, benefits that are um, too small for too many people. Um, so, uh, you know, reform of the pension system is also important uh, to reduce fiscal vulnerabilities and also to create space for uh, you know, more productive infrastructure investment. Um, uh, getting back to the issue of, uh, of land reform, um, there are a, a, you know, the more, a lot of the focus um, a, on land reform has been on lifting the moratorium. Um, and of course, uh, the moratorium is a problem. The fact that uh, there is a moratorium on the sale of uh, private land uh, is a significant problem, and this requires a solution. But uh, there are also many other complementary um, uh, reforms that are necessary to move land reform uh, forward. Um, uh, in one, one of the important uh, complementary reforms will be um, access to financial instruments. Um, uh, the, uh, the banking, the financial sector has to uh, be able to come up with instruments that would enable a wider access um, to the purchase of land um, if, um, if uh, the land markets uh, are opened up. Uh, so putting in place um, the, uh, the mechanisms uh, for uh, financial instruments to emerge, putting in place um, you know, fixing uh, the errors in the cadaster, um, and also moving forward uh, with uh, reforming the management of state land. Uh, that is also uh, that is also important. So, um, you know, we agree that uh, reforming land management is very important, but it's also important to do it right because if it is not done right, it can um, uh, result in many of the risks and, and outcomes. Uh, and poor outcomes uh, that uh, that you were uh, that you referred to. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna move to Kirsten with the question about um, you know there is one question um, which is um, among Ukrainians is a very popular question when it comes to the central bank and it would be nice to have your perspective. Some argue that the monetary policy is too tight, and in fact tightness of the monetary policy suppresses the economic growth. Others argue that there is actual excess liquidity in the system, and we face structural problems like NPL of uh, non-performing loans of 30% and lack of protection of creditor rights and issues with basically diverting of assets from the banks even today, um, or collateral, in insecurity of the collateral which uh, prevent us from, um, from um, in fact, channeling that um, liquidity into the economy. But this is what people say. Uh, but I also see an additional problem, which I want, again, on the second, on the other side. It's the capacity of the banks to identify the prospects uh, in today's uncertain environment. There's been a historic model which has more or less failed. As we have seen, there's been no sustainable growth. So banks have built some business models which sometimes are questionable, sometimes are very conservative. And those with conservative models survived, uh, but those with questionable models haven't. And maybe the banks also do not have the capacity, the banking sector, to identify the products and the projects in which they can invest. So the question is, what can or what should be the policies, or what, what are the ways that the central bank can overcome these challenges in, in again, in weak institutional environment? Yes, thanks for that broad question, and I have to be careful here in answering Absolutely. it, because... Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you want to come back. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, uh, we have, I can relate to what has happened in Sweden. We had a financial crisis in the 90s, and uh, at the time, the uh, 
banks in Sweden, they were highly leveraged. There was not enough uh, capital and they had a lot of MPL loans. So uh, the state had to step in uh, with uh, quite a lot of support and there was a state guarantee issued for the, all of the banks in order to make sure that the financial markets could function. Um, I must say the government at the time, they were very efficient in deciding that we have to take care of the banks, we have to take out all the bad loans from the banks. So they did uh, clean up the banks, they did uh, put the uh, MPL loans into bad banks and they, uh, over a few years the banks were rather healthy again. Uh, the supervisor requested banks to raise capital because uh, it was obvious that there was not enough capital in the banks. And I think that helps a lot because then banks, it's easier for banks to fund themselves, but it's also easier for them to expand and to get trust uh, from people and the market. Uh, then in 2008 and 9, we were also, uh, I mean, part of the more global financial crisis. And in 2008 and 9, it was not a credit crisis mainly, it was more a liquidity crisis. So again, here we learned that we didn't, uh, we did not have enough requirements on the Swedish banks, on requirements that didn't have, uh, their, their liquidity buffers in significant uh, currencies were not set at the highest level. So the central bank had to step in again with uh, quite substantial volumes of liquidity in order to make sure that uh, the banks were working again. And uh, I think we learned again that uh, we have to make sure that banks can uh, be on their own. So now there is, uh, I mean, a discussion in Sweden. We have prob probably the highest capital requirement in Europe. And the question is, is it hindering banks from uh, lending money? Uh, we don't think so. Uh, there is an, we have uh, inflation around 1% uh, in Sweden and the increase in lending from banks is around 7%. Uh, we have a boom in the housing market and so on. So there seems to be enough liquidity. Uh, the supervisor have also set the liquidity requirements on the buffers uh, uh, a lot higher than it was before. So then they are, have uh, learned that, uh, I mean, the first uh, line of defense is uh, to have uh, good rules and the banks, they have to manage liquidity on their own. And the second line of defense is a central bank. Uh, we are also now introducing a resolution system. I mean, it's more or less the same as in other parts of Europe. Uh, that is also something that will help in making sure that banks, we can close down the banks uh, if uh, necessary for the future. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to open the floor uh, for the questions. And we'll start with Yuri Gerdinschenko and I'll take some questions. I, I see some marks. Yep. Thank you. I, I have a I have a question for Kerstin. Um, you know, many people think of central banks as also developmental tools. And suppose you have the following situation. The current government of Sweden comes to you and tells you, look, we need to build a new national champion, or the current champion is not doing very well, like Saab is not doing very well, or Volvo is not doing very well, or ABB is not doing well. Um, the local banks, the Swedish bank, don't understand the situation, they're stupid. Um, or the cost of funds is too expensive. It's really the place where the central bank should step in and do this industrial policy. What would you tell uh, to the Prime Minister of Sweden? Yeah, <laughs> it, it's probably too easy for me to say uh, that because uh, I think they would never uh, come close to us with those questions. They, uh, <laughs> they would never call me on that. Uh, I think uh, in Sweden, uh, the uh, independence of the central bank is very important. And uh, uh, I think politicians in Sweden, they are even careful in discussing monetary policy. You know, we have a negative repo rate at the moment, and that is something that is discussed among journalists and in the markets and many things that is a strange thing. But politicians are very careful in discussing uh, monetary policy uh, even after the decision. So uh, I think in the 90s when the Riksbank legislation was formulated, this was an, a, a question and I think there were, uh, I mean, part of the politicians who thought that 
it was maybe not the right direction to give this independence to the central banks. But uh, after 10 years of discussion, and we have a f this legislation in place, and I think it works very well. And um, we don't have supervision in the bank. We have a separate supervisory authority. I think they are a little bit more close to the politicians because they are, they, there is a reporting line from a supervisor to the government. When it comes to the central bank, we have a reporting line to the parliament. So in that sense, we have a little bit more independence, I would say, uh, than the supervisor. So your answer will be, these guys will not ask you for something like this because they know the answer, it will be no and uh, a central bank should not lend money directly to whoever they are, it should be private banks. Yeah, thank you. that is close. Right, thank you, there was a question. Tima, Tima, can you yes. ask, because Absolutely. I, I feel there was, uh, I just want to clarify that I, you know, I was responding to the general question, the role of the state in, uh, in uh, supporting economic growth. I have, I think it would be a very bad idea for the central bank to get involved in that business. I was talking about the state in, in, in general. So and you I, argue for separation of the yeah, I think state absolutely. policies through budget and yes, perhaps absolutely. on the I mean, state the, budget. The kind of things and I the, talk about are, are you know, the, the Ministry of Economy. And the central bank is, yeah. being independent and not involved in the policies? Well, I, th I think the, the, it's not the role of central bank to... to, to I, I think the only where area I could see is if there were some uh, specific uh, challenges in individual sectors that had were financial constraints so but again it would be about addressing this sort of general uh, situation in the banking system and not about uh, you know pushing individual um, yes, please. individual uh, sectors from the from the central bank's point and maybe if I can add, I mean, the, it's, maybe it sounds like we don't communicate with the ministry and the supervisor. We have something called the Financial Stability Council. So we meet regularly with the government and the supervisor and the National Debt Office, and we are discussing financial stability issues, but uh, very seldom on an institutional basis, but more to understand where are the systemic risks in the market and how can we uh, promote more stability and how can we try to dampen the risk we are now seeing in the with the household debt for example absolutely thank you um Igor Shumila please I think at the uh, majority here it's uh, the uh, the they think the, the same way that uh, me uh, I go from the step that reform of the national bank gave a good result but at the same time uh, the national bank hears lots of things uh, to his address like complaints in uh, like uh, putting guilt on National Bank uh, and it's very important when uh, uh, the response of the people that will be here today and tomorrow uh, maybe they will speak about what is really the guilt of National Bank and uh, what is really the good result what is really the good result devaluation uh, devaluation of Grimna from uh, uh, 8 to 26 then the bankruptcy of uh, uh, many of Ukrainian banks uh, that's uh, 1.5 trillion of agreement uh, to the fund of of uh, guaranteeing the banks that uh, were closed and the money disappeared. And then, uh, the, what 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 the sense of this recapitalization uh, of the banks and bankrupted and never opened work? And there are lots of factors that uh, prerequisite of that and um, serve the ground. And unfortunately, uh, I. Uh, see, I don't see the the people who were involved in such activities, but still, uh, what would be the results? And uh, I, I think that uh, many of us, they are for uh, transparency, uh, um, strength and capacity of the National Bank. But again, why two uh, members of the National Bank board uh, 
were not signed by the president, that it's definitely it's a blocking of a Let's don't talk about the personal assignment because it's a really a policy conference. Well, OK, but let's remind England and USA where the candidates were appointed by, well, assigned by and appointed by uh, the president. But can we talk about the independence of the National Bank when the head of National Bank uh, meets the president and even uh, uh, don't uh, do, doesn't provide the list of uh, these candidates uh, uh, I mean, to the board, and uh, the people cannot hear what their programs, what is his names. This is already the fifth, uh, the fifth uh, question that you ask. Let's uh, give the time for other panelists. Okay, just one sentence. Just one sentence. It's uh, lots of uh, the people. They support these proposals that uh, well vo just have been voiced, but why don't you say how to do it? For example, that it's a small open uh, economy that is built on natural resources. Uh, how it can uh, provide for uh, economic and financial stability, growth, stable growth, and. Uh, there is um, a question that um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to sum it up uh, a little bit. Um, the idea is that we have uh, discussed that there's been progress in Ukraine, specifically in the central bank, and there is uh, the question is that is it really so? Because we have seen a lot of banks which have been come, become bankrupt. We have NPLs uh, with non-performing loans, and we have a, a serious uh, devaluation of um, the currency and. Um, is this really something that we can call a success? Um, there are then questions about the appointments when the president has not appointed the, uh, but I think really the questions were about the independence of the central bank, how you can maintain the independence, and uh, I think that's the broad gist of questions. Uh, anyone is willing to answer? Yes, please, sure. So, uh, um, I'd just like to say one thing. Uh, I think there is a good smell test for reforms. When people start screaming at things that are being done, that means that things are having bites. If, if, if everybody approves of things people good, then it probably is not going far enough. Uh, uh, the truth is that uh, uh, banks in the Ukraine until very recently have been used as an ATM machine by different you know, oligarchs and interest groups. And hey, give me money, you know, uh, and then then you create non-performing loans. This is this is it's really stealing stealing money from the government from from taxpayers, and I think to the extent that Mrs. Gontareva has successfully started, you know, uh, cracking down on that, I think is a very good thing. This is very successful. The fact that uh, uh, you know the. Uh, um, uh, monetary policy has started, you know, to to, to become seriously professional. Uh, uh, this is this is something this is something very good, and and I think a country like Ukraine, where uh, uh, the pressures from oligarchic networks to really continue to use the state uh, uh, for kleptocratic interest, is so strong that uh, I think you know, it, it's really very important to sustain the, the independence. And as far as I can understand, you know, when it comes to candidates to replace Mrs. Gontarova, this is, this is a strategic question. And it's not about you know, comparing to what you do in the US, etc. These are really uh, important questions that, that you know, need to be debated very seriously. And, and you know, I don't know exactly about, about the process, but it's clear that replacing Mrs. Gontarova with somebody who would be a puppet for oligarchic interests would ruin, ruin all the progress that has been done with you know, the financial system and with, with, uh, you know, uh, with macro policy, monetary policy in this country. 
just shortly, I would also like to add that I think what has been done here by the central bank is that they have developed a strategy for the central bank on the way to go. And I don't know if it's the right expression in English, but uh, Rome, Rome was not built in a day. I mean, this will take uh, several years uh, before this comes to an effect. But if you don't take care of the bad banks, the bad loans in the banks, banks will not be able to support the real economy and you will not get growth with the help of banks. So it is an important step that has been taken. There are many more steps that have to be taken for the future, but uh, this is an important area and I would say that it's impressive work that have been done with, has been done with the central bank and you should be proud of that. Thank All you. Right. Um, I will be taking more questions. Uh, I see some people, there's some excitement. We have 18 minutes. I'll stop exactly on time. So I'll be taking questions by two right now, two people at a time, and then we'll give the panelists an opportunity to answer. So I see a question, I think, from uh, Professor Karablin. He has been holding it. Thank you. Um, the question is to Professor uh, Berglof. Um, in 2012, uh, the European Union uh, accepted a new industrial strategy called uh, a Stronger Europ uh, European Union Industry for Growth and Economic uh, Recovery. And uh, the main idea of this strategy to restore the European Union as a new world industrial center on the modern technological basis. In the meantime, there are some other elements of the strategy. And one of them is uh, raw materials diplomacy, means that the European Union should be rounded uh, by the commodity economies. So my question is, what is the view of the European Union, the standpoint, on the place of Ukraine in this general picture? The first question, and the second one, uh, if it, uh, if, are you surprised uh, that we are talking right now, today, only about the agricultural future of Ukraine? And no one word was said, uh, said uh, about the industrial opportunities of the country. Thank you very much. Yeah, Eric, I'll take more questions before you guys answer. Yeah, yeah. Eric, Eric, for, just for, for, Eric, let me take one more question okay, and sorry. then we'll answer. Because, uh, Vadim, you had a question. I'll take your question next one in the next round. Okay, Vadim, please, your question. Professor Volosovich. Yeah, uh, so, uh, we, we have translation, so if you can speak to the mic. So my question is related to the previous one and even more concrete. So Europe uh, identified so-called six key enabling technologies, right? So and indeed they uh, share from nanotechnology, biotech, uh, advanced materials and things like that. So and uh, arguably, uh, well, I don't know how they were identified. They make a lot of sense, right? So but uh, oh, well, uh, the uh, very concrete advice which you gave in uh, this uh, medium ground between vertical and horizontal uh, approach to industrial policy it makes a lot of sense because it, it, it's very concrete. But to me, it's also uh, maybe suffering from, uh, well, the same issue as any industrial policy of even 70s. Is the government smart enough to see which countries should be involved in the international uh, uh, distribution networks and things like that. So who has the technical capacity? Should it be the role of uh, you know, foreign experts from Europe working in this key enabling technology? So how to make it more operational? Okay, um, Eric, please, and then other panelists as you. And then yeah, I'll take yeah. the next question. You and, so, 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 yeah, just to make very clear that I'm not speaking on behalf of the European Union. <laughs> uh, just so, so we get that out of the way. No, but, but uh, I think these are, you know, I was, I hope I was talking about exactly about what you do in the industrial part. I, I think agriculture is, the agribusiness is also a very important industry in, and, and uh, an industry that I think has enormous potential. So it's, you know, maybe it's, you know, you can't dismiss this as, as um, sort of agriculture is something that, that is, is you know, not related to, to, to industry. So, so um, 
And, and I think, actually, uh, you know, there's, as I mentioned, uh, the example I gave of, of uh, introducing um, inf information technology and, and um, uh, also, you know, bringing in uh, biochemistry and into to, uh, the agriculture sector. These are areas that I think have, have a lot of potential. But, but uh, what is the role of the European Union? I think the European Union in, in, um, in uh, Ukraine has, I think, played an increasingly constructive role. So I, 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 again, I'm, you know, I'm more an observer there than anything, but having seen how they have evolved in their thinking then, since Maidan, I think there is, it's a more constructive, more supportive, and it's focusing on, on the right things. I don't think the, the European Union in Ukraine should get involved in, in these kind of decisions about which, um, which industries uh, that Ukraine should, should uh, uh, invest in, but uh, should be focusing on institutional reform. And that's where also I think the European Union, through its sort of soft power, its ability to use uh, integration to, uh, to encourage uh, reform, I think, has a very important role to play. So, so to the question on, on um, you know, shouldn't we worry about, um, you know, the issue that Tima raised before about uh, capture, uh, you know, should we, we worry about uh, the uh, capacity, the ability of the state to, to make these kind of decisions? So I, you can come to this sort of, you know, my perspective on this was to say, you know, this is happening everywhere. I mean, it's, it's un, you know, every emerging economy and, and the temptation to go for national champions will go for, um, you know, to, to give in to these kind of pressures from oligarchic structures are there. So you have to, f you have to find a middle ground and a middle ground that, uh, where you feel that, you know, the state is somehow, you know, it, again, it's, it's uh, I think it differs a lot across different industries and in different um, areas. Uh, I think the, 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 the probably the scope for the state is greater when you, if you, um, uh, when you talk about uh, maybe addressing specific educational needs, uh, specific financing uh, areas. But also, as I said, you can use, uh, for example, procurement uh, to encourage uh, local uh, companies to acquire skills that will help you uh, connect to, to, to global value chains, for example. And, and I think when we spoke about industrial policies you know, 20, 30 years ago, it was much more complicated for an emerging economy to really become part of the, 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 these um, global networks. And, and, and now there is an opportunity. And I, I think the, it, this is a conversation you need to have. And, and again, I'm, there are many risks, and there are risks about changes. You're aiming, you're getting into the wrong sector. You, you, know, you, you, you have risks that, that uh, of course, of, of capture, as we said. But you have to have this debate, I think. Thank you. Any more? Okay, uh, I'll take the question from Professor Gates. Тимофій, я дуже коротко. Help me, please. Yeah, okay. So, all the speakers uh, were very positive in their assessments. Does it mean that, because you are taking the part in the conference uh, that is entitled as the role of the central bank in economical development, does it mean that the central uh, bank uh, has to change its uh, monetary policy in order to boost uh, economic growth, without which Ukraine will never see success? that we have all all the panelists have positively they have given a positive assessment to the changes that have occurred in Ukraine does it mean that the current policies in particular of the central bank as we are part of the conference of the central bank of the central banking conference have to be changed both monetary um, capital controls exchange course uh, and so on and so forth in order to uh, base the future growth or enhance the growth based on what has already been done. So I think the gist of the question is that there have been changes, stabilization has occurred, do we need to change the policy to reflect that and enhance the growth? That was the question. And uh, let me, I'll come on the next round. Yes, in a, in a soon, please. And then I'll, I'll take some more questions. 
Um, hello, everyone, in Asusan Kiev School of Economics. Um, I have a question primarily to Professor Bergulov, but probably someone else can answer that as well. Um, you had a strong case for, for industrial policy, and you're arguing for the industrial policy. At the same time, when we listen to the Ukrainian policy debate, uh, um, or even political debate, it's mainly not about industrial policy, it's mainly about deregulation and privatization. And that was actually mentioned some partially in the, in the presentation by the World Bank representative, so I might get a comment from you as well. Do you think that two can go hand in hand together, or those are the movements in the different directions? Can you argue for a solid industrial policy and at the same time argue for deregulation and privatization? Thank you. Thank you. Let's answer these questions, please. Um. Well, I, I'll, I'll you know, try to, um, to, to answer the second question, since it was directed to me, and, and, but it's, of course, somewhat related to, to the previous question, too. So, of course, this is the, the risk you always run when you talk about um, industrial policy, because it sort of leads people into to, um, all kinds of, of um, thoughts that, that uh, you, maybe you didn't intend. So, so, so um, to, to me, uh, you know, the, the industrial policy is some, you know, it's about, you know, the question is what, what is the role of the state in supporting economic development? Is there a role beyond just providing the general uh, conditions? Uh, uh, is there a role just through, for example, uh, encouraging privatization? I, I think privatization is very much part of, of, um, of the deep reform program that you have to have to, to build um, state capacity. I think, you know, you, if you overload the state with uh, running state-owned companies and, and, and trying to deal with all the problems uh, that are, are associated with that, I think there's very little scope for the state to play an active role in, 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 in industry and, and a positive role in, in industrial policy. But once you have uh, made progress on that agenda, and once you have succeeded in, in uh, creating the conditions where you can privatize and, and where you, you know, you, then you have to ask these questions, I think. There's no way around it. And, and I think the, the um, you, and, 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 but you, and I said you have to have a debate about these issues that we have put on the agenda in terms of the risks involved. But even when you do privatization and when you do it in, in specific sectors, you probably, you probably need to have a, a, a debate within that sector, you know, how can, how can this privatization change the condition? How can we use this privatization to really push forward um, uh, the connectedness of this uh, sector to, to the rest of the world uh, and so on? So again, I'm, I'm trying to encourage a, a, a careful debate. I don't want to, to, to try to trigger uh, policies now going out and, and promoting national champions and so on, but I, it's really about getting a more subtle debate. Can I just, you know, there's one thing that, uh, you know, is very relevant, relevant for this, and which is about what does it mean to go from a policy that has focused on uh, fixed exchange rate to inflation targeting? You know, that I think is, if you think about how that affects uh, the possibilities for corruption in, in the central bank and, and if you think about how it forces the, uh, the rest of, of the economy to, to think through the risks that are associated with uh, being exposed to international competition. Uh, you know, these are incredibly important processes to get going in order to build competitiveness in, in an economy. So you both can address the, the issue of corruption which was uh, you know, very much uh, related to, to the fixed trade, trade policy, but it's also an opportunity to build firms that think about, you know, what is happening in the world, you know, how do we need to, to take into account these risks? It's a, it's a long process, and, and, but it's something that is, you need to start it. Okay. Yeah, so, sorry for, for yeah. So just a few things on, um, just respond a little bit to the industrial policy issue, because it's come up in a number of questions. Um, you know, I think P 
people understand different things when they uh, talk about industrial policy. Uh, you know, one understanding of industrial policy is that the government goes out and looks for new sectors that need to be developed in a country and provides specific fiscal or regulatory incentives or tax incentives to particular industries or firms and, and, and so forth. Um, uh, you know, the other kind of industrial policy you can, you know, call industrial policy is to address the problem of uh, producers and industries and economic activity in a country in general. Um, there are too many things that need to be fixed in addressing the problems faced by industries uh, and producers in Ukraine and too few people to fix those problems for Ukraine to get into the business of identifying new sectors and providing specific incentives and ensuring that they, those do not result in perverse incentives um, uh, for, for new sectors. Uh, construction permits, it's enormous problem in Ukraine. Insolvency, enormous problem in Ukraine. Access to credit, enormous problem in Ukraine. Uh, uh, you know, uh, streamlining tax payment, enormous problem in Ukraine. Unless these problems in Ukraine are fixed, even if you invent new sectors and industries and provide specific incentives and uh, the, for you know, one or two firms to emerge, they will emerge and the next day they will be crippled. Um, uh, so I think, you know, I, you know, I'm not sure we're on different pages here. I think uh, you know, there are many kinds of industrial policy that Ukraine can do. One kind of industrial policy that Ukraine can do is you know, take care of the 3,000 state-owned enterprises that are a huge drain on uh, the public sector and that are a huge drain on economic activity and productivity in Ukraine. That would be great industrial policy. Um, I'm gonna take the last round. I think there are two people, Boris Kushnyaruk and Yuri uh, Prasorov, who would like to speak. Uh, I, we'll start with, with you, Yuri. Uh, and then that will be the last round. My apologies. Uh, thank you, Timofey. Uh, Yuri Prozorov, President of the Ukrainian Society of Financial Analysts and the former uh, State uh, Financial Service Commission uh, Vice Chairman. I have uh, two uh, short and professional non-politician questions, one, uh, one for Professor uh, Berglov and one for uh, our uh, Swedish uh, guest, uh, first uh, Vice uh, Chairman of Riksbank. Um, for Professor uh, Berglov, uh, what is your opinion about the role of the Export Credit Agency on the economic development and supporting of export as a part of uh, vertical or horizontal of sectoral uh, industry policy? Uh, as uh, one of the best uh, um, chief economists of EBRD, uh, you uh, have a big experience from European uh, Union and non-European Union, there are only two countries in Europe where there is no uh, export credit agency, Albania and Ukraine. Is this uh, really uh, problems for our support of uh, export, or what is your opinion about this problem? And for um, uh, First Vice-Chair, I'm Jochnik. Uh, there are, after uh, reforms of Ukrainian banking sectors, we have uh, 10,000 uh, people unemployment from NBU, from Central Bank, uh, who lost their jobs, and more uh, 100 people, 100,000 people in the commercial banking sector. Uh, you have experience of uh, Swedish Banking uh, Association. What uh, do you think about maybe need a help for these people to uh, retraining or reskilling from a banking sector in other new uh, maybe programming sectors? Uh, and what experience of Riksbank about uh, your uh, restructuring of uh, central bank and what the people of Swedish banks now uh, is, is have a new job or not. 
Thank you. Thank you. Let's take um, uh, Boris. Um, Boris Kushnirok, and I'll, uh, we'll have the third. Yeah, I'll take the third question from you afterwards. Okay. Just this is the last round of questions. Дякую за можливість задати uh -huh. запитання. Okay. Uh, ну, по-перше, чисто таке філософське, yeah. можливо, а скажіть, uh, So first we have a more philosophical question. Do you think that the central bank of any country can uh, uh, ensure long-term stability of the national ca uh, currency if uh, uh, economy is uh, based on, on um, based uh, on uh, uh, um, uh, so and one uh, uh, so this this country is uh, that uh, um, were united in the uh, European area, and uh, now uh, these countries have the same currency that they share um, between themselves. Um, don't you think that uh, there are problems uh, in the uh, euro area? Because the majority of the countries, they did not uh, um, improve their export. Uh, so don't you think it's a, it's a problem? about the possibility of medium term or long term price stability in the economy like Ukraine which has essentially commodity and it's or raw materials um, most of the trade and export uh, is done in this um, in this commodities while uh, it is an open economy and the second question was about the eurozone that uh, introduction of euro really in terms of current account and uh, uh, expert benefited um, Germany and Netherlands, uh, if I'm quoting correctly, but not the other countries. Uh, and uh, we have independence of the European Central Bank, but nonetheless, maybe something is wrong with the model of the economic policy. We're really uh, out of time, so if we can be short on the remarks uh, to the point, I would be much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, maybe I'll start. So, so I think yeah, I've certainly. Uh, managed in my intention to create a, a, a debate on, on this topic. Uh, you, know, I, you know, I've also been in the position of, of saying, you know, these uh, generalities about, about uh, you know, what needs to be done uh, in, 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 in broad terms. So what I'm trying to get a sort of more granular uh, discussion about, you know, is, are there things that the state can, can do meaningfully in promoting coordination within sectors? And, so, so, so that's just to, to, to on, 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 um, on the purpose of, of my remarks. On, on the export um, agency, export credit agency, I think that is a, I think it is a tool that, that uh, has to be used very carefully, and then it's certainly a tool that can be abused. I can see why, I know a little bit about Albania too, so I, I think I can see why you know, there's been some reluctance in, in establishing uh, one in Albania and, and maybe one in, in, in Ukraine. But I think that is something that one should consider. Uh, we know that exporting firms are very different from other firms. And, and if you can encourage firms to export, to connect uh, to international markets, that can be uh, incredibly important for productivity growth and so on. So you have to be very careful because it, it can become a tool, uh, but I think that's the kind of conversation that I think I should encourage, and that's very much part of what I think of as as, a, as an industrial policy. I try to answer the question about unemployment. The unemployment rate in Sweden today is 6.8%. If we look at the Swedes who have grown up in Sweden and with a good education, uh, unemployment rate is very low. It's uh, two and a half or three. So the reason for us to be at 6.8 is mainly that we have quite many refugees coming to Sweden and it's hard for us to uh, get them into the workforce as soon as we wish. So that is an issue that we are working upon. Uh, I mean, talking about the banking industry here, I can just relate to Sweden. We have had a, 
uh, high unemployment rates in uh, the uh, industry for furniture, for glass. I mean, when competition has increased from abroad, industry has moved out because it's cheaper to produce it outside Sweden. So we have had high unemployment rate in certain sectors in Sweden and in certain areas of Sweden. But uh, I think that this, this is something that you cannot really uh, uh, do anything against. That is, I mean, competition will produce the products where it's cheapest. So uh, the government in Sweden, they have always been able to try to support those who have been unemployed with uh, training, with education, taking people into uh, other sectors. Uh, so. I think this is something that we have been a little bit, we know that it's painful, but uh, we have to work upon it and uh, it has, I mean, uh, at least for the moment, we, I would say that the unemployment rate is at a low level. Um, I'm going to plug in the Kiev School of Economics right now, because education is the word, retraining is the word, and in particular we're also uh, grateful to the government of Sweden for support of the Kiev School of Economics, but I think education is important. I want to finish with the last 30 seconds for which each of the panelists. I want to come back to the question which Professor Gates asked about the new policies that we have to move forward with, given that we have macroeconomic stabilization and some progress. So, in other words, what's your big idea for Ukraine in 30 seconds? Sorry about this, putting you on the spot. Uh, we start with Gerard. <laughs> <laughs> so, continue the reform process unabated, deepen democracy, continue fighting corruption, support civil society initiatives. People should go demonstrate outside against the legislative project to uh, basically weaken the NABU and continue the fight. Thank you. Eric? I agree with all that. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 so, and, and so what I wanted to encourage was, uh, you know, Get, uh, start thinking about how your manufacturing sector can connect more to the rest of the world. And you know, that discussion is already there. Try to think about uh, some positive experience. I, men I mentioned the Peruvian experience, which I think is, is very relevant. Actually, Albania has a, done a you know, really uh, interesting experiment in the textile sector. So I think there are, you need to get this uh, conversation started. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with the uh, former ever? speakers and <laughs> continue on the reform process and support the independence of a central bank and make sure that the central bank cannot solve all the problems here. There must be a, a cooperation between the different policy areas and a, and a strategy to make this happen and make a, a growth coming back. Thank you. Yeah. I, I would say um, inform and involve the people. Uh, in order to continue and deepen the reforms. Many reforms have been done, but as you do more reforms, as you, as you deepen the reforms further, you will get into some of the things that are even harder to do. And in order to do that, you need to carry the people with you, you need to inform the people so they understand the issues, and you need to inform the people in a smarter way than those who are trying to disinform the people. So I think engaging uh, with citizens, uh, getting citizens more involved in the reform process will ultimately be the key to success for Ukraine. Thank you very much. This, on this fantastic note, I thank you all, everyone here in the audience. I thank the panelists and I declare the session closed. Thank you.